Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Kerwin. I'm the director of the Loyola Institute. And the Loyola Institute uh, is the organization responsible for this of theology, uh, which I think is a wonderful title. I'm not quite sure what a festival of theology is, um, but I suggest that uh, at least let, we need to look festive. So if you see photographers at any point, smile. And uh, I mean, we'll convince ourselves that this really is, well, of course it is an enjoyable occasion. And uh, we're very, very uh, glad that you were able to come along today and to join us. And I hope that many of you obviously will be here for the continuation uh, of the festival tomorrow. We got off to a great start last night with a, um, a public lecture given by Dr. Con Casey, who is the first director of the Institute. And these, these celebrations are partly uh, to do with him and uh, marking his contribution to the Institute and the Institute itself, which is 10 years old this year. And that's uh, why this, um, this really is a festive occasion for us. So you're very welcome. Thank you very much for coming along. I am very briefly just going to welcome uh, the person who's going to welcome our first speaker. Uh, we have Professor Sharon Ryder will be uh, starting us off this morning. Uh, but I would like to uh, ask Professor Shane Allwright, who's the pro-chancellor of the, of the Trinity College here, to, to say a word or two of introduction. And I just want to say that uh, uh, Professor Allwright's connection with the Institute goes back a number of years. She's now pro-chancellor. She was registrar of the college and was enormously helpful to the Institute in its early days of being set up. So it's lovely that you're back with us today and thank you for being with us also. So over to you. Thanks for those kind words, Michael. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to introduce today's first keynote speaker. Professor Sharon Ryder is Professor of Philosophy at Uppsala University in Sweden. She's Deputy Director of Engaging Vulnerability, an interdisciplinary research program hosted by the Department of Anthropology, and also since last year, Deputy Director for the Higher Education and Research as Objects of Study Research Center at the Department of History of Science and Ideas. She's a government-appointed member of the Scientific Advisory, Board, Advisory Committee for the Swedish International Cooperation Agency and an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Humanities at Uppsala. In 2020, she was elected to do the Executive Board of the Philosophy and Theory of Higher Education Society. She was the first recipient of the Home Tank Award for Significant Contributions to the Humanities in Sweden. Professor Ryder has written at length on the role of a university and in particular on the place of arts and humanities. Her work focuses on the cultural conditions for autonomy, responsibility and knowledge. This morning I am very honoured to invite Professor Ryder to give today's opening lecture entitled Higher Education as a Road to Somewhere in which she reconsiders the place and purpose of higher education in the 21st century a topic of the utmost importance, I'm sure you will agree, to all of us here today. So, thank you very much, and Professor, Professor Ryder, please. I want to thank everyone, especially Fonta Ryder, for giving, doing me the honor of inviting me here to be with you at beautiful Trinity College. Um, I should say at the outset that I'm not a theologian, um, although, as you, I hope, will infer from my talk today, I have a deep and abiding interest in and concern for what one might call higher things. By this I mean principles, ideas, and the place of human life in the order of things. I've read my share of Plato and Aristotle over the years, and I've been inspired by philosophers and thinkers who read and understood them far better than myself, people like uh, Simone Weil and Iris Murdoch and Plato, or Elizabeth Anscombe and Hannah Arendt and Ar on Aristotle, and so forth. Uh, and there are also... Sorry to cut it. Sorry. There are people who say they can't. Okay. <laughs> Even closer. Okay. okay. Is yes? That right? Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Um, this is all just introduction, so 
it's not important. <laughs> right. Um, so I've also, I mean, religious, great religious thinkers like Plato, I'm sorry, like um, Augustine and uh, Aquinas are also kind of backstage presence, um, even if I make no claims whatsoever um, that the study of these philosophers of religion are my area of specialization or even competence. My concern, what I'm interested in as a, as a philosopher, are things that constitute the human condition. Things like work, speech, thought, and action. And I'll be talking about those things today, but in very concrete terms, um, which I will then relate to the aims and purposes of higher education. I've taken the liberty to write in a rather personal tone rather than a scholarly style, because these are genuine problems that I have on my mind, not the kind of standard problem and standard solution that you often debate in academic journals. Um, so the paper is admittedly a little moralizing or normative, as they say. Uh, I apologize for that. That's not my intention. But for reasons that I hope the paper itself will make clear, I stand by my decision to state my position honestly, rather than hide it behind academic verbiage. In his bestseller, <laughs> The Road to Somewhere from 2017, David Goodhart made the case for an understanding of our current liberal convulsions as having to do with place. He distinguishes there between two tribes, as he calls them, one nomadic, the other rooted. The first, uh, the nomadic ones, he calls anywheres. People who value autonomy, mobility, and openness to new experiences, while the other, the somewheres, value security, familiarity, loyalty, and tradition. Importantly, the first group tend to be more educated than the second. He stresses that the worldviews of both are legitimate and deserving of respect, but happen to come into conflict on certain fundamental issues. And that conflict expresses itself in um, political convulsions, such as we've seen with Brexit, the election of Trump, and so forth. Importantly, while the labels are his, the value groupings are something he finds in sociological and, psych and psych psychological data. So it's a meta study. It's based on studies of studies of people's values. One of the most salient features of anywheres is that their cosmopolitanism is something they developed during their years at university. It is, as it were, central to the hidden curriculum of higher education that one becomes a, an anywhere and embraces the values associated with that. In a similar vein, uh, the, auth the novelist, uh, essayist, and poet Wendell Berry, an American, um, in, in a book, uh, a collection of essays called Home Economics, as other as in other uh, essays, describes especially how public universities have betrayed the mandate to serve the people and places in whose names they were first established. Instead of educating the youth so as to make them useful for others, universities work to uproot them, to direct them away from home into exploitative careers that are destructive for communities and homelands, their own as well as other people's. Today, I reconsider the place and purpose of higher education in the 21st century in light of such criticisms, hopefully without falling back into nostalgia for a remote and romanticized picture of the past. In the first section, I will lay the groundwork for the rest of the talk by discussing a number of concrete social challenges, most of which will certainly be familiar to you. In connection with these challenges, I then introduce and expand upon a few central elements uh, in Berry's, especially Berry's idea of the centrality of place for human beings. In the second part, I draw out a number of implications for education, especially higher education. And finally, I conclude with a handful of reflections on the university itself as a special kind of place. Um, David Goodhart 
and not just in um, The Road to Somewhere, but especially in a more recent book called Head, Hand, and Heart, makes the case that universities are victims of their own success. That we, as a matter of fact, have created a world in which you, there's for a number of important kinds of training and education, we really don't need universities anymore, partially because of the things that the universities have accomplished, such as internet. Um, so, um, so, but he notes there's a, there's a serious challenge. I had four universities, and that is um, since the end of the Second World War, for the first time in history, we have the advent of mass professions, not mass vocations, mass professions. Professions used to be part of a certain small group of, they were sort of elite. But now we have mass professions because so many people go to university. So in the UK, for instance, in the 1970s, only 8% of a year's cohort, up until the 70s, only 8% of a year's cohort would attend university. By the 1990s, it would be 50%. Assuming that the tide won't turn anytime soon, one might ask, as Goodhart does, what is gained and what is lost in this rapid transition in our way of life? For we cannot know the human value of something if we don't know its cost. In Goodhart's analysis, education in general, and higher education in particular, have become a driver of specific priorities and identities, and as such, a force in politics. With regard to identities, he cites Talcott Parsons' distinction between achieved and ascribed identities where the first is highly individualized, while the latter is something that assumes a place in a community. An ascribed identity is something given. You define yourself in relation to others who are already there. As such, it is vulnerable to social, economic, and political alterations in the fabric in which it is enmeshed. By contrast, achieved identities are something that utilize the context, whichever one that happened that that, hap that might happen to be, these achieved identities are more flexible, even fluid. They go with the flow. Those who remain in their communities, by choice or by necessity, will find their identities disturbed or even dissolved in the so-called knowledge society. As one writer put it, rather drastically, already in the late, late 80s, these remainers, these people who remain in their villages and industrial towns, will become and I quote, roadkill on the information highway. But the promise, the compensation that we offered was that if they sought and achieved a new identity, leave their homes and their way of life and cultivate their cognitive capacities, they would be free to roam and make their way in the world, the whole world, the whole world would be their home. In Goodhart's terminology, being a somewhere is quite simply less and less a viable way of life. The goal is to be self-sufficient. Home is where the self is. The aspect of ascribed identity, um, one aspect of ascribed identity is that it is an unconditional recognition. As a member of a family, a community, or a church, you are a unique and irreplaceable human being. In a society in which you have to leave to achieve, as it's called, the safe and secure anchoring is broken the individual is unmoored. As the, as the statistics I, that I mentioned indicate, not all, not all will be successful at navigating their way up the narrow and shaky upward climb, and many will take a hard fall. We will, return to, uh, we'll, we will also return to this risk, that of failure, and failure in our day is tantamount to a crime. Once this casual disregard for the fate of those who don't make it, this insouciance toward human invulnerability. On Goodhart's account, it is a consequence of the dominance of the anywhere values, the ones largely propagated by universities. Novelty, cosmopolitanism, anti-traditionalism, and especially a particular sense of objectivity. Let's stress on the object, where everything is treated as an object of cognition, rather than something of intrinsic value, having its own worth, which entails a bias against and derision of the principles and practices of care. Care of the land, the home, the young, the elderly. A second consequence of the move to anywhere, 
the university understood as the road to success is that rural communities and industrial towns are stripped of their most valuable natural resource, their brightest kids. The backlash against the highly educated urban elites and the universities that created them in this light is perfectly understandable. From this angle, the universities can hardly be seen as contributing to the well-being of the places from which the students recruited are culled. The problem exists not just in the periphery, though, but it permeates the entire knowledge economy, which doesn't actually require all these knowledge workers and will likely need fewer and fewer as artificial intelligence increasingly supplants even mid-level professional work. And indeed, we have seen both wage stagnation and job loss among the middle class for a number of years now. There's been a decline in the so-called graduation premium, the value added over the course of a lifetime of employment in terms of higher salary for those with a university degree. Goodhart cites studies that have shown that over 30% of graduates work in jobs not requiring a college degree five years after graduation. Instead, they're taking jobs that would normally be held by high school graduates who they have outcompeted. But this does not mean that these jobs now offer higher salaries. About 35% of college gra graduates do get high pay, high status, professional or managerial positions. But as for the rest, about 65%, the statistics, the statistics seem to indicate that, indicate what one might call an overproduction of elites. Among the consequences are diminishing returns on investment in higher education and disappointed expectations for many graduate students, college graduates. At the same time, as the pandemic so brutally demonstrated, there are certain kinds of work that cannot be yet automated or export, exported, namely those that have to be done here and now in some determinate place, often face to face. Nurses and nurses' aides, plumbers and electricians, farm workers, not to mention workers at the, the jobs, the existence of which many of us were only dimly aware, were suddenly the great heroes of the crisis. We were reminded of how important it was for all of us that this work was being done and being done well. One hopes that we will not forget this lesson and that their workplace conditions and remuneration for services rendered will be improved in light of it. But there seem to be deeper lessons to be learned. In particular, perhaps we should stop selling the university as the key to economic security and social status. We might, for instance, invest more in non-university post-school education. That doesn't mean that people who choose the path, that path would be shut out from all that the university has to offer. To the contrary, instead of making a university degree a kind of insurance policy for, which, policy for which you have to pay high premiums to protect yourself from the vicissitudes of economic life, the university can conceive of its mission as something entirely different. For instance, to enrich the life you have and to serve the community in which you live. I will return to this suggestion later. A related proposal is to stop academicizing and credentializing professions and vocations. In Sweden, the old nurses' training programs, police academies, and teachers' colleges were not integrated into the university system because they were inadequate or somehow failing. In the decades after the Second World War, Swedish schools were among the very best in the world, both in terms of inclusion and achievement, as was medical care, much of it performed by highly qualified nurses rather than doctors. The integration was rather a consequence of policy, one of the ideas being of it being that attaching the university label to the qualifications would enhance the prestige, and it was hoped, at least by the unions, the pay of nurses and teachers and police. As a matter of historical record, they experienced instead a steady decline relative to other jobs, slow and steady decline, at least until a few years ago when they rose somewhat and have since stabilized. These concrete suggestions, however, are not the top of my topic of my talk. What is, is the recognition that our ostensible mer meritocratic system is failing us, and worse yet, failing our children, our future. Whatever else wants to, what wants to say about it, meritocracy is at once indispensable, if one means by the word that good work should be encouraged, and destructive, if it causes irreparable social division. The challenge is to reconceive it so that it is functional again, as it was when liberal democracies adopted it as a form of social organization. And in order to understand that social function, we have to reflect on the society of which it is a part. Uh, my next section I call, What We Stand On, Small Solutions or How to Do Something in Particular. 
In response to a request to write a narrative of the future, uh, Berry admits, and I quote, so far as I can see, the future has no narrative. The end of something, history, the novel, Christianity, the human race, the world, has long been an irresistible subject. The future has been equally and relatedly an irresistible subject. How can so many people of certified intelligence have written so many pages on a subject about which nobody knows anything? <laughs> Perhaps we need a book, in case we don't already have one, on the end of the future. Now, Barry is known for his stance that small-scale farming is essential to healthy local economies, which in turn are essential to the flourishing of the human being and the survival of the planet. But this description of his work misses something essential to Barry's thought, namely that the guiding principle in all this is humility in the face of the sacred or holy, which comes to expression in the life and health of the world and the peaceableness of human communities and households. As long as we consider natural resources as economic assets and not, as we once did, divine gifts, they will be treated as such. And that has to do with the necessarily future-oriented technological mindset. The creative, the, the creative destruction, um, Schumpeter's term, the creative destruction of the industrialists and industrial economists who think that evil is permissible today for the sake of a greater good tomorrow. Barry's ethics and eschatology are to be understood in opposition to what he calls futurology, the emphasis on what is at present non-existent. And his view is that we should begin by backing out of the future into the present, where we are alive, where we belong, where there are provisions at hand and in reach that are useful, encouraging, and full of hope. To the extent that we've moved out of the future, we've also moved out of this just general sense, this objectified sense of the environment as something out there into the actual places where we actually are living. Taking Barry's cue, I will consider what it would mean to retrieve belonging, place, particularity, and the now as our home, and what it may provide in the way of what Barry calls small solutions and ways of thinking, acting, and working that help us to stop trying to save the world and start instead living savingly in it. And I want to talk about higher education from this small scale point of view. It is said of youth that it is, char that it is characterized by optimism, that is, too much energy and not enough experience, while well, the reverse is said of old age, too much experience and not enough energy, which is why we old fogies, or old fogies like myself, tend to be pessimists. What I say here, I hope, shows that I'm still young at heart. In an essay called, um, the Irish Journal, recalling a trip to your fair country, Barry complains about our contemporary notions of excellence, which he thinks commits itself uh, passionately to cliches of individualism and a uniformity of innovation, ignorant of what precedes it and destructive of what it ignores. In contrast, he proposes that we understand the real genius of a country, though it may indeed fructify in great individual works of genius, to be found in the fine abilities of tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of ordinary workers. Recalling his visit to Cormac Chapel, he says that he was reminded of, quote, how long, complex, and deep must be the origins of the best work of any kind, unquote. This is an important theme throughout Barry's thinking. Knowledge and understanding are to their products, skills, innovations, techniques, applications, and products of all kinds, as aquifers are to wheat fields and orange groves. And the underground system of human thinking that is the condition of our thinking, understanding, and knowing is just that, long, complex, deep. For this reason, you can't always tell from the landscape where the source is hidden. Indeed, you have to be ready to look with great care and assiduity. You have to pay attention to your surroundings, including people in the environment, those who know th how things are there. But in interaction with somewheres, that is, people who take themselves to be part of their little corner of the world and responsible for protecting it, the assumption among anywheres is that prof as professionals and experts, those who speak, as Larry describes it, most incomprehensibly and dispassionately, the assumption is that they're right and that those who speak plainly and with passion are wrong. A sense of allegiance for the community and its members, a feeling of urgency and responsibility to take signs of danger seriously, carries no weight in the presence of 
objective facts presented, even when it is obvious to all concerned that those facts are produced by methods that disregard the kind of knowledge that people living and working in a place possess. From the point of view of the latter, there exists a powerful class of itinerant professional vandals pillaging the country and laying it to waste. Berry remarks, if one wrecks a private home, that is vandalism. But if to build a nuclear plant, one destroys good farmland, disrupts a local community, and jeopardizes lives, homes, and properties within an area of several thousand square miles, that is industrial progress. Mm -hmm. Posing the question of what characterizes such people, his answer is prescient of Goodhart's almost 30 years later. But he says that these, these anywheres uh, must fulfill two requirements. They are upwardly mobile transients who will permit no, permit no stay or place to interrupt their personal advance. They must have no local allegiances. They must not have a local point of view. In order to be able to desecrate, endanger, or destroy a place, one must be able to leave it and forget it. One must never think of any home, of any place, as one's home. One must never think of any place as anyone's home. One must believe that no place is as valuable as what it might be changed into or what might be taken out of it. As an ideal type, the professional careerist is one who, quote, generalizes the world, reducing its abundant and comely diversity to raw material, unquote. In contrast, a local would never willingly use anything um, in such a way as to destroy it as a natural human resource or endanger the use or place, the use or place of use. The second requirement, insofar as we talk about professionals, is that they have the benefit of higher education. They are a credentialed class whose degree guarantees their epistemic pedigree. Barry considers that many of these vandals were educated publicly funded institutions such as so-called land-grant universities in the US ones that were founded with the explicit mission to receive the daughters and sons of their regions, educate them, and send them home again to serve and strengthen their communities. They have, as also uh, Goodhart has noted, essentially betrayed this mission. They've worked instead to uproot, and I'm quoting uh, Barry now, uproot, uproot the best brains in towns, to direct them away from their home into exploitative careers in one or another of the professions, and so to make them predators of communities and homelands their own as well as other people's." Unquote. What universities are or should be for, Barry thinks, is to enable young people to serve, to bring them to responsible maturity, and help them to be good caretakers of what they've been given, the earth, the community, the culture. Such an education should be, in the best case, both pleasant and useful to have. And if it is to be used well, it must be used somewhere, where one lives or where one intends to live, or one intends to continue to live. It must be, as he says, brought home. Failing to do that, selling higher education as a commodity to increase, for the cost of tuition, the customer's personal advantage on the market for social status and the fat paycheck that comes with it, is to stoke the coals and fan the flames of division into two kinds of people. Those who want to defend the health, integrity, environment, cultural positions, and even existence of certain places, their homes and communities, and those for whom such words signify nothing. But notice one thing about this division. What the somewheres are protecting, one might say, is a particular, the right to particularity, the right of particularity to exist at all, one might say. And this is precisely what the cosmopol cosmopolitan point of view cannot abide, because it is seen as backward, parochial, and in a spot in his inhospitable to change, at least such change as is instigated or forced upon them by external forces. It seems to me that a university that is doing its job, one that deserves to be on the map, so to say, is one that circumvents this division, that serves the human community and the natural world of which it is a part by recognizing what philosophers of place call allocentricity, the directing of one's attention to one's surroundings and other possible perspectives from a certain position such that no one point of view is central, not even the view from nowhere, such as, it, as is attempted in objective descriptions of facts and things. In, fi in this last section, I will argue for the university as a place where allocentricity is enabled and enhanced, thus improving our ability to understand and know others, our shared world, and ourselves. But this understanding, as we shall see, is not a mere cognitive capacity severed from the world it inhabits, but must always be grounded somewhere. You must dig where you stand. So 
Um, Han art is a concept of the love of the world. This is why we engage in education. Um, it's why we engage in action. So I'm thinking now about the university and the human condition and our love of the world or lack thereof. Specialization in the sciences is a matter of, as a fact of life in the academy and has been so for a century or more. Its merits and dangers have been the subject of theoretical and practical reflections and discourse for as long as there's been this specialization for at least 100 years. And you find this in the work of Max Weber, Ortega y Gasset, Hannah Arendt, and others. In some sense, it's perfectly sensible and natural. As Berry notes, good work, whether in masonry or writing or teaching or farming, requires focus and sustained practice. Concentration means a narrowing of attention. And to master a craft or a science, you must do so over a long period of time. And there are many fields of endeavor that allow for superlative or shoddy craftsmanship. But there's something else occurring in scientific specialization that moves beyond this simple necessity. And that is that um, work can easily degenerate into mere dexterity, where the workman ceases to be concerned for the thing made and has no longer any responsibility for the thing, no longer responsibility for it, and therefore has lost the knowledge of what it is that he is making. The factory hand can only know what he's doing. What is being made is no concern of his. Now, this loss of care for the, what is being made um, has also led to a loss of consensus on what it is that is being made, on, on, on not just um, as a whole, but what we're doing at all. And I'm thinking particularly in the case of education. Because in the case of education, and th there all the wise men and women throughout the ages have been um, in agreement, what is being made in education is humanity. A university can be a place where we not only prepare students for careers and working life, although it's all very well and good that we do that, and not only prepare students for the lives of citizens, which is also quite important, but in the first instance, to prepare them for their role as responsible heirs and members of human culture. Barry would agree, I think, with John Stuart Mill's view, as famously expressed in his inaugural address at St. Andrews University in 1867. And I'm quoting Mill now. And this is the inaugural address as vice chancellor. Mill says, universities are not intended to teach the knowledge required to fit men for some special mode of gaining their livelihood. The object is not to make skillful lawyers or physicians or engineers, but capable and cultivated human beings. It is very right that there should be facilities for the study of the professions. It is well that there should be schools of law and of medicine, and it would be very well if there were to be schools of engineering and the industrial arts. But these things are no part of what every generation owes to the next, as that upon which its civilization and worth will principally depend. Men are men before they are lawyers or physicians or merchants or manufacturers. If you make them capable and sensible men, they will make themselves capable and sensible lawyers and physicians. In Barry's words, good work and good citizenship are the inevitable, inevitable byproducts of the making of a good, that is, fully developed human being. This is what he understands as the mission of the university, a mission that is quite close to what Ortega y Gasset recommends in his book with that title, <laughs> The Mission of the University. When I think of the, uh, this is just an aside, but when I think of the una unanimity on this question among some of the greatest minds of the last two centuries, I'm inclined to agree with Schopenhauer's aphorism. Schopenhauer says, in the main, the wise have certainly at all times said the same thing, and the fools, which is to say the vast majority at all times, have always done the same thing, namely the opposite. <laughs> and so it will remain henceforth. Um, at any rate, the problem with specialization is that technical jargon and, jargon and the conceptual apparatuses are exclusionary, not just of many students, but of most faculty. There is a loss of a common language, something that unifies the university so that it is one place and not an arbitrary concatenation of tribes that have nothing to do with each other except for occupying approximately the same space. As a displaced entity, the university, it, cannot take responsibility for anything, for there is no it. There is no unity that animates its actions and judgments. There's nothing binding it together, making it this place, but something more than a physical location containing offices, lecture halls, seminar rooms, gyms, and parking lots. But on the assumption that what we want is good work, and what is being made in the work we do is humanity, the question arises, what is the quality of that product? Does it serve the needs of human life, communities, and the natural world? In short, is it well made? 
Well, if the thing that we're trying to make is well-rounded human beings, willing and ready and able to serve others and continue the work of cultivating and protecting the natural and cultural world, Barry thinks not. Rather, we create the specialist, the careerist, the graduate. I'm going to skip some stuff here. Yeah, OK. Um, so OK, given all of this, what, what, what do I think we should be doing? I think we should return to the medieval notion of a core curriculum, <laughs> right? The lower faculty, which prepared you to take on the higher faculties, should you be, sh should you uh, succeed, right? That would enable you to become the priest, the lawyer, the doctor. And what do they learn in the lower faculty? Well, they learned the trivium and the quadrivium. The, the, it was very broad and very basic. The mastery of letters and numbers. Okay, so the trivium was grammar, which is the form of language, logic, the content, rhetoric, the expression. And the quadrivium, arithmetic, which is number, geometry, which is number in space, harmonics, number in time, and astronomy, number in space and time. And these uh, purposes are themselves both public and private. It's good for the individual because it enables him or her to go further and apply to what he or she will, to serve as she, he or she will. But it's public because it belongs to everybody. These are very basic things, arithmetic, geometry, logic, and rhetoric. So the question of what all people, those who Hannah Arendt calls the newcomers, should be expected to know and understand to, um, to uh, I can't read that. <laughs> to achieve, to realize their human potential and fulfill their human responsibility is too little discussed. But the I, very idea of a core cur curriculum is of vital importance since we can't do everything. Much of what is learned at university today, particular methodologies and techniques and applications can be at least as efficiently taught at vocational schools or through apprenticeships. People should not have to go to university for the sole or primary purpose of learning these, to seek formal qualifications and become credentialed. It's not necessary. There are other ways of doing that. But furthermore, and this is important, it can lead to the misapprehension that failure at achievement in school is failure as a human being. But we must acknowledge the, 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 the uh, boundaries between school and the rest of the world. There would be no problem with maintaining or ideal, ideally raising standards at university, for instance, if that boundary were respected. Not succeeding at university implies neither general ineptitude or, nor stupidity. As Berry remarks, it is not rare for the judgment of the world to overturn the judgment of the schools. There are other marks of ability than good grades on academic examinations. And it is not in the least bit uncommon to encounter people who excel not only at their fields of endeavor, but also in sound judgment and virtue in matters political, aesthetic, and moral, who have not studied university. Um, interestingly enough, despite, um, despite his cosmopolitan uh, worldview, uh, Immanuel Kant makes exactly this point on, in several places, where he says that neither education or scientific training is necessary in the case of moral judgment. One can find wise men among the simplest people and complete fools among the scholars. Thinking as such requires no study. It is an innate human faculty. In questions regarding, requiring practical judgment, the decisive difference is not between the educated and the uneducated, or the trained and the untrained, but between those who make demands on themselves, who try to the best of their ability to be honest and consistent, and those who them, fool themselves and others. The point of a moral education for Kant, in contrast to a scientific one, is to aid them in their attempts to think for themselves and to do it well. That is enlightenment, if you will. And it is something purely negative. It means liberation from one's own prejudices, as well as uh, reliance on the authority of others. The only way to that is what he calls critique, to be willing and able to subject the conditions of one's own thinking to examination before and with others, and without prior assumptions about what is thinkable or unthinkable, what Han Arendt calls thinking without banisters. Um, I want to say one more thing about how diverse the student population has become. 
Of course, the language in which any student is introduced in the world, the social conditions in which he was raised, the characteristics of the natural environment in which he lives, all could or have been otherwise. They're contingent in that respect. But they're also the absolute starting points for a human being. These are the soil out of which one's beliefs, desires, inclinations, and basic inclinations and suppositions grow. A formal education that is not rooted in and derived from the actual determinate conditions of thinking cannot con constitute a refinement of it. At best, it will be just more information, not anchored in the student's own thought, but added on to it like a dangling appendage. Simone Weil remarks, and I quote, a lot of people think that a little peasant boy of the present day who goes to primary school knows more than Pythagoras did because he can repeat parrot-wise that the earth moves around the sun. In actual fact, he no longer looks up at the heavens. The sun about which they talk to him in class hasn't for him the slightest connection with the one he can see. He is severed from the universe surrounding him. She complains that pupils study geometry as a game or to get good marks, but not to seek any truth in it. Quote, the majority of them will always remain ignorant of the fact that all our actions, the simple ones as well as the judiciously combined ones, are applications of geometrical principles, that the universe we inhabit is a network of geometrical relations, and that it is to, it is to geometrical necessity that we are in fact bound as creatures enclosed in space and time. This geometrical necessity is presented to them in such a way as it appears arbitrary. Could anything be more nonsensical than arbitrary necessity?" Unquote. We don't have to embrace Weil's platonic, view of geometry, Weil's platonic view of geometry to acknowledge that the presentation of geometry, or, arithmetic, or arithmetic for that matter, as just one technique among others makes it look as if they are not absolutely necessary for our way of thinking, for the simple reason that this is how we calculate. The necessity is real for us, just as the idea that there can be alternative geometries or base systems requires that we are first familiar with what it means to add or to measure in the plain sense presented in school books. A university should be interested in the truth of what it teaches in just this respect. It wants to know what place the knowledge developed will have when it's brought home, how it will take root, the uses to which it will be put, what it will mean, how it will matter. Without living up to that sense of responsibility, the university is going nowhere. Thank you.